problem with uh, any kind of conference, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Um, the problem with any kind of conference that talks about a time frame is that your, your interests never quite fit. Um, so uh, we're going to go back a wee bit to go forward. Next slide, please. Um, many of you in the room have heard me talk about this before. Um, I've been studying this topic for 25 years now, and it never fails to surprise me, amaze me. Um, a couple of things I've found out in the past 12 months, um, just remarkable. And increasingly, I used to stand up and uh, make kind of rash observations that this was a huge industry. It had to be world class. Absolutely, um, absolutely incredible in all sorts of ways. Um, and I'm getting, starting to get brave enough to be able to say things like best in the world, most prolific in the world. Uh, and I'm actually able to substantiate that now, which I wasn't always able to. Next slide, please. So why and why here? Um, without giving you a, a, a long talk about the ins and outs of uh, materials technology, um, we go this way. John talked there about this huge drive uh, for construction, um, but there was also a drive for hygiene. The, a lot of the early architectural iron founders were making really exotic things like uh, downpipes, gutters, sash weights. Um, and actually, for all of the firms that I'll talk about today, or reference today, that kind of stuff remained bread and butter for a very long time. Colebrookdale was incredibly important but Caron was everything for the industry in Scotland. Um, the establishment of Caron in 1759 brought the expertise from Colebrookdale, um, which was promptly sucked from their brains. They weren't particularly happy in Scotland. There are all sorts of accounts um, about the drunken Scots and how lazy they were. Um, and eventually they went back on their way. But the legacy of Caron was incredibly important from a skills point of view, but also from a design point of view. The relationship with the Adams, with the, the Cairn Foundry in particular, and bringing the, Harvards up, the Hayworths up from London uh, as architectural carvers and pattern makers, perpetuated for a few hundred years. Um, we have the raw material in Scotland um, in terms of black band ironstone. It's not perhaps as critical as uh, once I, I maybe thought um, but certainly the material that was available in Scotland was particularly suited for ornamental work. And then James Bowman Nielsen comes along in 1828, invents a hot blast, and we're away. Next slide, please. Um, I, I, I hate to say this in Glasgow, but actually um, the man from the East really originated um, the, the industry in Glasgow. Thomas Eddington, uh, whose Phoenix Ironworks you see here, um, was a salesman at Caron, um, managed the, the Cram and Ironworks for a while and by a circuitous route ended up in iron production in the west coast of Scotland very prominently. And the Phoenix um, really was uh, the first um, architectural iron foundry. Uh, James Sword had an earlier uh, foundry than this, but um, it's really the, the earliest establishment that was actually producing architectural work. Next, please. Now, you ain't going to be able to read this. Um, this is my thesis on a page. Um, um, but basically, at the top of the, the slide there, that, that red box is Karen. Um, all the other coloured boxes here are Scottish firms um, that have a substantial architectural output. Um, not a minor one, a substantial one. Um, many of these firms are 1,000 hands plus. Um, and you can see the interrelationship between these firms right into, this is the 20th century. Next slide. So if we take a slice across um, the, the Gilded Age that we're, we're talking about here, it's actually really interesting. Um, you definitely get some of the key prominent firms, um, McFarlane's, um, Lime Foundry, can we count Kirk and Tillich as Glasgow-ish? Um, certainly people like McDowell Stephen uh, and George Smith's Sun Foundry. So actually, that's quite an interesting way to do that. Next slide, please. 
You certainly won't be able to read this. But this is uh, some work that the Scottish Ironwork Foundation have uh, done over the past decade. Um, and we've been tracking um, iron structures that were made or made or found in Scotland and tracking these all over the world. Um, we're at about 4,500 uh, structures uh, at the moment. Um, these are firms, um, the big guys that were producing things, and these are different types of manufacturers. Um, just remember, when we come back later, the big peaks every single time, Saracen. Okay, next please. So, um, there are a profusion of com companies that we could talk about, but I had to just pick a couple. Um, so I've picked my favourites, which are entirely self-indulgent, um, but also I think those firms that reflect design and decoration uh, most interestingly. Um, George Smith and Walter McFarlane vie for my favour quite a lot, um, and I've got a real soft spot for, for this guy. Um, I would love to have met him. He's a fascinating guy. And the more I get to know about these firms and their work, the, the more I feel that I get a sense of who these men were. This guy was fascinating. He was born in Larbor. His father worked in the Falk, one of the Falkirk foundries. I suspect it would probably have been Karen. Um, and he was a pattern maker. He was exceptionally well-educated, self-educated, um, and moved to Glasgow to work uh, with the Saracen foundry of Walter McFarlane and Co. Next, please. Um, the Sun found he left McFarlane's in 57, which Walter McFarlane was not at all happy about um, and promptly uh, to come to court for infringement of specialist knowledge on moulding pipes, I remember rightly, um, and established with his uh, brothers um, the, the Sun Foundry. Now, straight out the box, um, he was competing with his former employees. Um, he didn't have the means to finance himself, so he relied on um, input from financiers and the banks in particular. Next slide. An established uh, and quite substantial sun foundry in Kennedy Street. This is around 1890. Next slide. And um, like many of the Glasgow firms, this fantastic uh, facade, architectural historian might uh, historian I am not, so you won't get any architectural descriptions from me, but um, certainly um, this, this, this theme that you find very consistently, the, the Lilliputian people of Glasgow and these monstrous uh, facades are always adorned uh, with the works of the firm. Next. Um, they, like many of the other Glasgow firms, Upper Thames Street in London, I always feel, must have been like a mini Scotland. All the big architectural iron founders had premises in Upper Thames Street in London. Um, this was the, the Sun Foundry's premise, quite modest in comparison to the other firms. Um, and straight out the bat, they, they, they were developing a style that was very much their own. There's something really interesting to me about George Smith as a pattern maker. Um, when you look at Sun Foundry structures, and I've been inside quite a few, um, there's an attention to detail and attention to design um, that's not there with the other guys. Um, I was at an award ceremony last week and uh, sat beside a guy who was advocating Colebrookdale and we had a great fun for two and a half hours um, and I roundly trumped him uh, on structures and design um, and he had to admit that Colebrookdale were fairly inferior um, in terms of their large structures. Um, just for fun, uh, bit of a reference. Um, this, this structure was at uh, Gorbals Cross, and the only extent example um, is in St. Kitts. And I've been talking to the local community recently who are really enthusiastic about recreating this, which is, uh, yeah, you've got to love the nerve. Next, please. So in design terms, um, George pushed it really far. Um, and I always use this example. This is a drinking fountain in Airdrie. Uh, I'm not sure how this thing stands up. Um, it must extend uh, below the ground. Um, unfortunately, it was lost. It took us a while to track this down and uh, work out where it was, but it's just bonkers. Um, and, and kind, but it kind of sums the man up, I think. Um, this marvelous, marvelous structure, um, 
that we've been very involved with uh, over the, the past decade, um, the, the Grand Fountain in Paisley, which if you haven't seen it yet, uh, following its restoration, go and see it. It's just fabulous. Um, as part of the, we were helping them out, um, local authority, we, we established that the, there was a colour scheme by Cotier, um, which was very exciting. We did quite a lot of paint analysis um, and then managed to uh, create a version of what we thought the colour scheme looked like. What was really interesting about George and his approach to decoration, more than any of the other firms, he was incredibly interested in surface finishes. So um, at this fountain, we get things like bronzing, um, and bronzing takes three or four different forms, whether that's a powder applied within a shellac or a heated cast iron with a powder rubbed into the surface. All sorts of weird and wonderful things going on with linseed oil, um, overpainting, mixing shellac with gloss finishes. And I'm, I'm really pleased to say that the firm uh, that did the restoration work really got into it. Um, and whether what we've ended up with is entirely 100% accurate, who knows? I think it's probably about 80% there. Um, but it's just remarkable and is a fabulous statement um, that things weren't just black. Next, please. Um, George was a fairly unlucky, unlucky soul. He, was, uh, he went bust um, three times in total. Um, from a, a, a company history point of view, it's incredibly confusing. Um, because his name then gets carried on. He moves somewhere else and sets up another firm with the same name. But um, they were still producing fantastic examples. All the, the big Glasgow firms made uh, bandstands, but there's something particular about a sun foundry design, and there's an efficiency of design. Um, when you clamber up into the roof spaces, it's beautifully detailed. And of course, all the stuff that you would never see, but really reflects really nice quality engineering. Um, and of course, the, 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 the Bridgeton Cross uh, clock tower you see here on the right. Next, please. Um, like many of the Scottish iron founders, and you saw that chart early on with all the, um, the different lines going between, um, the interrelationships, as, as Ranald mentioned right at the start, incredibly important. And the, the links and combinations are absolutely uh, fascinating. So George um, was party to that. Of course, he was a product of Sun Foundry, um, but two of his staff went off and established the Sun Foundry in Ad Adelaide, um, on the other side of the planet, obviously, um, and certainly for their first 15 years, mercilessly ripped off the Sun Foundry. Um, whether that was done with permission or not, I don't know, but it's, when you sit with the two catalogues, it's quite amusing. Um, George's son went off and established the Rising Sun Foundry in Shettleston, which I really don't know very much about. It was uh, G.B. Smith and Co. It didn't last uh, very long. And interestingly, Robert Cruikshank, um, who went off to Dunny, uh, Dunny, Denny, um, and established what was primarily an agricultural engineer, small engineering uh, works in Denny, um, but did this lovely uh, Fountain Canopy and Govan, which is the strangest structure, and it's a mixture of his own works and bits of Sun Foundry as well. So it's really confusing to try and be able to work out which bit's which. Next, please. Um, Sun Foundry excelled in its very short life um, in fountains in particular, um, and the quality of their work in fountains is, is just astonishing. Um, and they're still turning up. Um, this is a, a beautiful picture of a drinking fountain within the market um, in Jersey. Um, and obviously these were shipped right across the planet, um, particularly right throughout the empire. Next. Um, yes, this is a bit tragic. I'm ashamed to say that um, before, when it went, 25 years ago when I was a lot younger, um, I used to be in and out of this building all the time and I was just starting to get interested in architectural ironwork and stupidly, stupidly, stupidly never made the connection. Um, this was Fife and McGrouthers forever, uh, which supplied um, architectural hardware, nuts and bolts and the like. And this is unfortunately um, the fire that happened in the 90s. Um, but this was the Kennedy Street uh, Sun Foundry. Next, please. 
So I want you to hold this in your head, this image. This was the, the showroom um, many years ago when I started to look at this thing. I used to pick up catalogues and look at these images and think, well, it's just a piece of conjecture, but no, they were real. Um, slight exaggeration, perhaps. There's a similar picture of Saracen, which we'll see shortly. Um, but this showroom existed. Um, and the reason we know it existed was, next please. This. Um, and when I said earlier that things often surprise you, I, I got a phone call earlier this year from a man in Murray, um, who it turns out to be was a bit of a cast iron anorak too. It was a great meeting of minds. And uh, he said, I've got the cast iron ceiling from the, the Bank of Bengal um, that was made by Sun Foundry um, that I bought in a yellow paper. You know that yellow paper that comes out to sell things? And I bought from a Polish guy in Aviemore. Um, <laughs> so I, uh, Gordon Urquhart and I toodled off up to Murray and we had a very pleasant day. And actually, what it, as soon as, as, soon as it, we, we, kind of, we knew what it was, the, after the building had burned, um, I blagged my way into the building and uh, certainly Glasgow Museums picked up what, the cornice work, the cast iron cornice work um, that was in the boardroom. Uh, what we didn't realize is this stuff had come out before and this was the ceiling out the showroom. Um, so this gentleman in Murray had bought it. It was lying in a field. Um, he's cleaned it up and I'm happy to say he's just given it to us uh, and we're going to incorporate as much as we can into our engine shed in Stirling uh, to demonstrate the, the fantastic use of the material. Next, please. And on to McFarlane's. Next, please. Um, the impact and the importance of this firm for me just continues to grow and grow and grow. Um, their proliferation was remarkable, um, but actually, from a design perspective, from a marketing perspective, from a business perspective, um, these guys had it down. They weren't the first in lots and lots of ways, um, but they took the threads of things that worked from other people and were really the first foundry really to glue it together. Um, they were this tremendous breeding ground uh, from other firms. And the sheer ostentatious nature of Walter McFarlane and his ambition and his uh, ego, I think, be a fair word, um, is reflected in this structure. So there were three generations of Walter McFarlane associated with the firm. This is his nephew, Walter Jr., as I call him. Um, and this um, gas lamp uh, was bound for London. Um, it was actually um, used as a photograph, we think, for registering the design at Kew. Um, but Gordon uh, bought this photo, it turned up in a junk shop in, was it Holland, Gordon? Um, bizarrely, um, and it's just the most wonderful picture. Next, please. So, um, this is where we start um, in Clacken of Campsie, which is quite weird. That's where my grandfather comes from. Um, but I, unfortunately, I can't find a, a relationship there. But as I mentioned earlier, three generations uh, of uh, McFarlane's involved with the firm. Next, please. So, Young Walter comes from very modest uh, beginnings. Um, he definitely, he, he, there, there was definitely a bit of manipulation of the story. Uh, one of the things I dislike intently about the internet is some of the things that were written about the firm in the 80s have become fact and accepted fact and then just proliferate across the, the internet. Um, and one of the, the myths that's perpetuated was that he was a jeweler and he never was a jeweler. He was the shop boy. Um, in the jeweler shop. Um, he fell in love with the boss's daughter, which is quite astute, um, left the firm. Uh, he was an apprentice uh, blacksmith, which I think is quite important. So his grasp of materials and how things fit together and design um, was there. Self-educated again, um, went to technical school at night, studied art and uh, creative um, creative arts in particularly, and ended up in the, 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 the Moses McCulloch uh, foundry um, in the Gallagate. So he leaves there after an altercation with his boss 
um, and Saracen that is born in 1850. Next slide. Key to this, um, so he falls in love with the boss's daughter. Um, he then marries the boss's daughter right around the time that he's trying to set up the firm. Uh, so old man Russell, uh, who owned jeweler and with a very strong connections uh, to Butte um, and Argyle, basically farming stock, um, put the money in. Um, there are lots of uh, great archive records that have recently discovered um, letters from Walter to his father-in-law begging for money. Um, and I kind of lost some of my respect for him when I read some of this correspondence. But old man Russell wasn't daft. Um, what he did was fire his son Thomas in to the firm um, at a very early age, and he was there to look out for the family interests. Next, please. So um, they start um, in what's been described as a, a brass, an old brass foundry in a Gallagate. Um, it was actually a bell foundry, um, completely tangential, but actually Glasgow was a prolific manufacturer of bells. Uh, somebody needs to go and look at that at some point, if anybody's looking for a research project, but they were really important. So they took over the bell foundry um, of Struthers, I think they were called, um, and gradually outgrew the foundry. Next, please. As I mentioned earlier, um, initially, no architectural work. The first architectural work that I can find is about 1857, um, and it was uh, a reference to a balcony um, that was manufactured. But what Walter did was interesting, um, and there's a fabulous account by Thomas Russell of the early years of the firm, which tells us such a great deal. They weren't doing anything different from any of the other firms at this point. But what they did was they cut out the middlemen. They bypassed the, the salesmen that would basically come out and uh, barter with the firms for orders. Um, they pushed catalogues really hard straight out the tracks in the first 10 years. They employed their own traveling salesmen. Um, and the 1851 exhibition clearly had a significant impact on McFarlane. I've never been able to prove that it was there, but I can't believe he wasn't there. Um, but there are so many references when you look back at the 1851 exhibition in terms of aesthetic design influence. The great canopy that Colebrookdale made for the exhibition instantly appears as a canopy and then is proliferated by all the other Scottish firms. Next, please. So, um, Saracen Foundry very quickly gets too small and we move quite quickly to Washington Street. Again, the people of Glasgow uh, are fairly diminutive in scale. Um, and incredibly quickly, this building becomes too small. They really explode at this point. Um, there are no images apart from this one of this building. There was a fairly significant fire. Um, these are molding shops. Um, but you see the level of detail in the account and the builder at the time talks about the incredible level of ornamentation. Um, this chap's, the terminal um, on the ends here is he's actually a blacksmith. Um, and he, that motif was then found on the, the, the final foundry at Postle Park. Next, please. Um, I like this picture because it gives a, a fairly accurate um, picture of what the firm uh, were manufacturing at their peak. So we're well and truly into the, um, the, the, the age that we're talking about here. The firm understood that manufacturing things like pipes and gutters and the like were fine, um, but the margins in them weren't significant. Where the added value came was where um, a structure brought together an assemblage of cast and sometimes wrought iron uh, components. And this burst of civic pride, um, they positioned themselves to be able to provide products to fulfill that desire for benefactors. So this is Brechin, um, really nice uh, found, spray fountain, complete with rather odd drinking fountain at the front and then this wonderful bandstand, which is one of the, the few bandstands that hasn't been messed about with uh, still, and it's still in lovely condition. Well, it's original condition, it's not in good condition, it's original. Next, please. So, um, they open up 
a big London warehouse. They open up a big warehouse in South Africa. They have very strong relationships with people right across uh, the, the empire, and they shift their focus very much to architectural structures um, and building relationships with young designers and architects in particular. Next, please. So they outgrow Washington again, and they cast their eye to the north of the city, and uh, the, what was the, the what was Postle Mansion. Um, I don't know if you can see this tremendously clearly. This is a, 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 Google, um, a Google view of the street plan of Postle Park, and it's, it's really interesting when you look at the, the foundry illustration on the left and how it is now. The street structure hasn't changed any, so it's, it's really interesting to think, um, and you can walk up this road and imagine you come over, come over this Saracen Street and you come over the brow of the hill and you would have seen the building frontage. Now McFarlane thought about all of this stuff. Um, the tenements that were constructed around the foundry were there for a purpose. Um, and like all good industrialists, you pay your staff and then take it back off them um, and rent. Um, but he purposely laid this out. This was ambition on an incredible scale. Next, please. So this is a frontage. You see him he's still using his uh, blacksmith. Um, this dome didn't appear to last. Um, it existed, but it didn't appear to last uh, very long. But um, within, underneath uh, was the showroom. We'll see a picture of that in a minute. And you see the, the chimneys of the, the cupola furnaces for uh, melting the pig iron for uh, casting. Um, next, please. This is a fabulous um, aerial view. Um, you can see the cupola furnaces spread about here. You can see the railway line coming into the back of the foundry. Um, the prefabrication yard, you can see a, what looks like a railway shed and a bandstand being constructed here. And then some kind of I don't know, maybe it's a Durbar Hall or something like that, um, being ready to go shipped out to India. So the counting house and the admin was to the left-hand side, uh, and then largely moulding shops, um, and the, the showroom was just behind the main entrance. Next, please. And this is a showroom. Um, everything that's in this picture was made by the firm. Um, and I think we've established that we can identify examples of most things in this picture. Um, but it was just remarkable, beautiful. Next, please. And, of course, we Walter from uh, Campsies, um, who lived in a fairly modest house, a very modest house, in fact, um, built for himself 22 Park Circus, um, which is just wonderful. Um, the, his nephew, Walter, second Walter, also lives in the house, and the, the house has actually been quite nicely restored. Um, I think it's still up for sale, Ranald. Still up for sale. I can't persuade my wife to get a mortgage that big. Um, but the, the, the level of ornament and detail in it is just beautiful. I have a weakness for arts and crafts and Art Nouveau, and there's some beautiful features in here. And the ironwork within the building is very delicate um, and beautifully formed. Um, Ranald has told me he had a, a notion, he came across something once, there was a reference to Walter uh, having a recreation of his, his wee button Ben in the attic of this building to, re, to make sure he reminded himself um, of what his roots were and the bugger's forgotten where he saw it. So if anybody comes across such a reference again, please let me know. Next slide, please. Yes, that just gives you a feel for the, the, the sense. Uh, the opulence is just fantastic, isn't it? Next, please. Um, so the second Walter McFarlane arrives. Um, the original, uh, the original uh, partners retire, so James Marshall, Thomas Russell, McFarlane. Uh, Marshall and uh, McFarlane are buried within 20 feet of each other in the Acropolis, which is quite nice. Um, Russell's buried uh, just outside Rothsey. And uh, Robert Fulton, who was a counting house clerk, uh, becomes uh, very involved and particularly focuses on the international markets. Next, please. 
and I'll just give you some very quick examples. So this is a, a market um, emblem in South America. The South American market were in, was incredibly important. Um, Brazil and Argentina are awash um, with ironwork. We've fortunately had a couple of students looking at um, ironwork in Argentina and in Brazil in recent years, and the stuff that they've dug up is just remarkable, much, much more than I ever expected. Um, India, we really haven't looked. We're scratching the surface in India, um, and I think it's just incredible. South Africa, likewise. Next, please. Um, this is one of my favorite uh, theaters in Brazil. Next slide. Entire cast iron frontage, and then the, the interior with these beautiful S-shaped -sh -S curved uh, balconies, actually incredibly difficult to mold and make. And that was quite a key theme with McFarlane's. He pushed the boundaries constantly, and you can see similar um, products made by these firms um, trying to compete with each other, fountain canopies in particular. So all the big guys made fountain canopies of some shape or form. Nobody made them as big as McFarlane's. So the one outside, uh, the one in Glasgow Green, the Bailey Martin fountain is a good example of that. Uh, none of the other guys made them on that scale. Um, but there was this competitive edge going on. Next, please. Um, we're very fortunate. There are maybe half a dozen examples of this book kicking around, um, but a photographic book of the works of the firm, um, which is an astonishing thing, um, and something which the Scottish Ironwork Foundation reprinted in part a very long time ago now. Um, we still have some copies, if anybody is interested. Um, this um, really exemplifies entirely cast iron, shipped to India, complete with painted glass, and the, the records boast that they only baroque three panes of glass or something. You know, so think about the logistics of design, prefabrication, shipping to the other side of the planet, and reconstruction um, in the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s. It's an incredible feat of achievement. Next, please. Yep. Um, let's skip over this one. Um, next, please. Um, so, design, incredibly important. Brand, incredibly important to Saris. Next, please. Advertising, um, extremely prolific. Catalogues, extremely prolific. Um, and even designing catalogues and brochures for the South American market. Next, please. And catalogues in particular were really strong. Um, don't have time to go into this uh, in detail, but um, some of you, and actually some of you contributed to this, so thank you very much for that. Um, the litho blocks that printed the 1882 6 edition were found uh, just over a year and a half ago um, being used as paving slabs in Shettleston. And uh, the, the, found, the Scottish Ironwork Foundation uh, did a bit of crowdfunding. We managed to buy them um, at auction. And uh, I picked up the prints uh, from some of the the blocks last week, uh, which is really exciting. Um, but that's just a taste of more of that later. Next, please. Next, please. So just finally, just to give you an example, um, the, 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 this marketing prowess and this level of ornamentation. Um, so um, first exhibition stand. Next, please. And then we get grander. Next, please. And then we get seriously grander. Um, just incredible. And it's just, it's just out there. It's just incredible. Next, please. Associations were really strong uh, for McFarlane's. And he, he was very smart. So young, up-and-coming architects um, who, who then became the establishment architects that was a very important relationship to, to McFarlane's. And it's something that probably needs uh, dug, dug into in a, a bit more detail. But these relationships uh, were symbiotic. Um, so, you know, early commission design work from the firm then resulted in fairly major commissions. Um, and Alexander Greek Thompson is probably the, the best example of that. But he wasn't the only one there. There was a quite an extensive uh, range. Next, please. 
And just to finish with, this is well outside our time period, but I just think it's a beautiful thing. Um, so think about Walter, the first Walter McFarlane, in his button Ben in Torrance. The third Walter McFarlane, Colonel Walter McFarlane, who was the last uh, person associated with the firm, this was his car. Um, it's recently come up, uh, it's been sold a couple of times in the past uh, three or four years, and it's the most beautiful thing, but I think actually um, is quite a, a, a fantastic symbol. Colonel Walter McFarlane, um, when the, 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 the foundry became part of Federated Foundries, um, used to get driven about um, in this, and he would toddle off uh, to Kirk and Tillich to go and see Cameron and Roberton, and uh, his chauffeur would drive him around in this. It's a wonderful thing. Next, please. Thank you. Thank you.